Hey everyone, this is Chris Davis, your video feature producer here at 4Player, and this is my list of my top 10 games of 2017. Of all the franchises and storied series that have hit the market in the past 30 years, there is none celebrated more fondly than that of Mario. I would go so far as to say that it had such a phenomenal impact on popular culture that there are probably less people on the planet that know who Mario is than there are that have summoned Mount Everest. Hell, there's probably an uncontacted tribe somewhere in New Guinea who have heard the legends of the Jump Man who battles evil giant turtles to save his beloved. Bye, digress. The wait for a new, proper 3D Mario platformer has been a long, long time coming. Over seven years to be precise. And once again, Nintendo has proven to be the king of the platformer with the much-anticipated Super Mario Odyssey. It has all the trappings of just what makes a true 3D Mario game such a great thing. Exceptional level design, fun platforming challenges, memorable characters, the works! There's a lot to love here, but what really makes it stand apart from its predecessors is probably both its greatest weakness and yet its biggest achievement. The world design and progression system. I think it's more than fair to reiterate what everyone has said in that the replacement of the traditional stars from earlier games for the moons could have been much better done. After a certain point in the game, you come to realize that the moons feel far less rewarding than stars ever were, and they're used to artificially gate players between levels feels like a bit of a poor decision. That being said, however, much of their hidden nature is pretty stinking good, especially when you consider the sort of side quest nature some of them require of the player. If only there weren't so goddamn many of them, and the earning of much of them wasn't so inconsequential, it'd be a better experience. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the ability to possess enemies and objects in the environment thanks to Mario's new companion, Cappy. With an enemy variety as diverse and enjoyable as the worlds themselves, it becomes a ton of fun to track down every enemy type in the game and find out just what small or large puzzles relate to them. From a Hammer Brother to a Goomba, from a tank to a stinking Tyrannosaurus Rex, most of the puzzle design delightfully incorporates them, or some gimmick that they're capable of, in making the earning of moons a mostly satisfying experience. Hell, can be made for some of the most interesting boss fight scenarios of this year, which is a lot to say considering how many great titles we got this year. I really, really enjoyed my time with Super Mario Odyssey, and while I enjoyed so very much of it, it couldn't make it any higher on my list. Has Nintendo surpassed the awe and wonder of what Super Mario 64 was? No, most certainly not. But it's definitely superior to many that have bore the Mario name. I'll readily admit that I've never been that big of a Sonic fan. In fact, up until this past year, I haven't played a single game of the franchise since I was in elementary school. Apart from Sonic 3D Blast, for one reason or another, I never put my hand on a single 3D Sonic platformer. Mostly because the vast majority of them received less than stellar reviews, but also that there have always been far more interesting tiles to check out. At the same time, however, I've been rather eager to play some of the fan-made games that various Monty communities have been working on for the past several years, such as Sonic 2 HD, Sonic 3 Complete, and Sonic Utopia. This past year, Sega released their newest 3D platform in the franchise, but just a few months prior, released a rather poorly marketed but exceptional 2D entry, Sonic Mania. Now, not only is this game, in my opinion, a dream game for classic Sonic fans, it's really and truly the little fan game that could. And when I say fan game, I'm being entirely truthful here. The game was developed by several key and prominent members of the Sonic development community. 
Sonic Mania, at most, is only half of a new full-on Sonic experience. Instead, it should be considered more of a remix of the classic quadrilogy of titles, with a handful of fresh new level thrown into the mix. Classic almost has you left in zones such as Green Hill, Chemical Plant, and Flying Battery make appearances. The twist, however, comes to the act structure of the game. You see, the first act of the zone will play very, very faithfully to the original first acts as they were released back in the 90s, designed specifically to teach the player about new gameplay ideas that are unique to the zone. The second act is where things get really interesting, though, as most of them are completely new takes on the zones that take those newly learned mechanics and expand on them significantly. Even the boss fights get the remix treatment as well, as each one is a delightful, feeling unique twist on the fights of yore. One minute you're fighting against Eggman in a giant capsule machine which drops miniature versions of bosses and capsules, and the next you're dueling him in a straight up match of Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. There's not a single fight that feels unbalanced or unfair. In fact, considering that you can earn lives very, very easily in this game, a game over is something you'll probably never encounter in your first playthrough. Easily the best part of the game has to be the soundtrack though. Put together by T. Lopes, known already for his well-done remixes of classic Sonic tunes, what we get is a great mix of classics with upbeat, inciting variants that complement each second act. You'll be hooked to the soundtrack as soon as you hear it, especially with the Chemical Plant Zone Act 2. Trust me on this. Sonic Mania is a love letter to the diehard fans of the franchise and proof that a 2D Sonic game made over two decades later can be great. As I mentioned several years ago in my 2014 Game of the Year video, Wolfenstein is a franchise that's very close to my heart. That year we got a new entry from a freshman development team with a more serious, dramatic take on a video game character who, realistically, had never experienced any sort of depth in his character. I mean, no offense to Peter Jessup or Matthew Kamiski, the two actors who previously voiced our main protagonist, but their performances couldn't derive any substance from the considerably little that they already had to work with. Wolfenstein The New Order, however, absolutely blew me away with Brian Bloom's depiction of a tired, scarred, time-displaced BJ Blazkowicz and his journey through a post-Nazi victory Europe made for one of the best narrative FPS experiences of recent memory. To use the word eager to describe my excitement for the next entry in the franchise would have been an understatement, as I anxiously awaited the next act, teased simply by BJ's rendition of Emily Lazarus's sonnet, The New Colossus, found engraved inside the Statue of Liberty. What we got wasn't quite the full-throated second American Revolution War story I dreamed the new game would be, but for what it did in the face of modern times of prejudice and fear that have dominated American politics for over a year now, it's a remarkable achievement. The continuation of the Wolf of Science story is one that not only speaks true to the traditional idea that the second act is the roughest, darkest part to an overall greater tale, it also takes the Nazi-themed nightmare scenario and absolutely runs with the idea in outright shocking new ways. I was not prepared for how much creative liberty Bethesda must have allowed machine games to work with when tackling an early 1960s Nazi occupied United States. I mean, our US was in the middle of the civil rights movement and still feeling the effects of the Red Scare. Machine games made it readily apparent that they're about to make things far, far more tumultuous within the first five minutes of the game when we are presented with one of the most shocking depictions of bigotry, intolerance, and child abuse ever depicted in this medium of entertainment. BJ's now signature narration style only engrosses you further in the plot and, while it doesn't feel as fresh as the previous game's fish out of water scenario had going for it, I still found it enthralling. The creative liberties machine games were allowed extended even further than I could have expected, however, when it comes to the depiction of the Nazis. Now, if you haven't played the game yet, then I don't want to spoil a major reveal for you. Instead, just go ahead and skip to the time code you see listed on your screen. I'll give you a few seconds to do so. Alright, ready? Okay. I'll simply come out with it here. Adolf Hitler is in the game. Now, you may say, sure, this is no big deal, he's been plenty of games beforehand. And yes, while this is true, it's been a rather unwritten rule in the gaming industry over the past couple decades that you do not feature Hitler in any real capacity other than either film or radio archival records. I mean, think about it. Outside of Wolfenstein 3D and the Sniper Elite series' assassination pre-ordered bonus DLC, how many games out there have ever depicted the most reviled human being ever to exist? 
I personally find it fascinating that Machine Games was not only allowed to present Hitler within a game, but also in a manner that feels shockingly accurate to the man he must have been. While I don't want to spoil the scene for you, suffice to say, his presentation is one that feels shockingly accurate when compared to the accounts of the man's behavior leading up to his suicide in 1945. This inspired the fictional sci-fi techno-Nazi theme that permeates throughout the entirety of your playtime. And yes, you're able to do exactly what your first instincts are when you see them. Gameplay-wise, everything that made the No Order a great game is back this time. The timeline system depicting slightly altered events based on a decision you made at the beginning of the first game returns. I mean, the differences, at least in my first playthrough and my subsequent learnings about its follow-up, feel not as vast as its predecessor presented. One of the main complaints some have brought up, the need to look to pick up ammo and armor, is removed from this sequel, making it a much faster experience, and you know how the ability to do wield any of your weapons, not just the same type. These are complemented by a new set of enemies to combat, and a refined officer system that contributes to a series of small side quests that you can optionally take advantage of. Though there is a fair amount to complain about in regards to the health system this time around, it's actually part of the narrative for why it has changed, which I don't want to spoil. Everything adds up to a better and stronger combat system this time around. Wolfenstein The New Colossus had the foundation for being a tremendous sequel to one of the best games of 2014, and though I'm a tad disappointed with some of the game's design choices, I'm otherwise enthralled by so many others. It's not quite the sequel I wanted, but it's a strong follow-up to the first game. These days, it's getting increasingly harder and harder to find multi-platform AA games. Where 10 years ago you'd have 5 Tack and the Power of Jujus for every one Ratchet and Clank game that came along, in 2017 it feels like you'd be lucky to have one or two spare competitors arriving within the same release time frame, let alone any original ideas from development teams without a franchise or a pole title to call its own. Every once in a while though, we get one that stands out and gets a few minutes of the spotlight, and this year, for me, that was Get Even, a first-person mystery game from The Farm 51. The team whose biggest contribution to gaming thus far has really just been a remake of the original Painkiller from 2003. While some will say that I've argued pretty poorly in favor of Get Even on the podcast and with others regarding its hidden gem quality, I adore it so much as to put it above the sequel to my 2014 game of the year, so give me a break, will ya? Get Even, to be fair, is a title that you should not go into with a preconceived understanding of the story and how it should play out. Hell, if you're interested in it from what I'm describing here, then I implore you to go on Steam or your console's digital storefront, because good luck finding a physical copy at GameStop or any major retailer, and buy it. It's only 30 bucks. And play through it from start to finish. I Honestly, honestly, I'd love to hear your thoughts after you've completed it. If you absolutely have to have a concise description of the story, though, then I guess I'll give you a bit of a walkthrough. As Cole Black, a name which Crispy openly and so thoroughly despises, you are tasked with recounting the events leading up to a kidnapping gone wrong in which you failed to rescue the child of a client you were working for, and from which you were heavily wounded. With the aid of the Pandora device, a head-mounted system not unlike a VR headset, you recount memories and fractured manifestations of what happened before the kidnapping in order to discover the identities of the people responsible and thus get even with them. In between these segments, you are thrown into a rundown insane asylum whose occupants are also equipped with their own Pandora headsets. As you progress throughout the game, these two seemingly parallel lines of gameplay begin to intersect and interact, with the latter being a rather entice narrative exercise while the asylum sequences progressively become a more horror-focused nightmare scenario that feels like the developer's fever-induced depiction of the back half of condemned criminal origins. Player choice also plays a significant part in telling Gideon's story, which, again, I don't want to spoil it, but without discussing particulars, made me increasingly engage as everything progressed. I know that what you're seeing right now is footage you've previously seen on the podcast, and my argument for Get Even is me trying to be as cryptic and unrevealing as I can make it without dealing heavily into spoiler territory. And admittedly, it's not the best way one can be sold on the game. Gideon's actual gameplay mechanics aren't anything revolutionary or even really complimentary by comparison either. But with that in mind, I can only say that this one was a standout. It was one of the most surprising experiences I had all year long. I hope you'll take a leave of Aethon. Get Even will inevitably be one of those titles that will disappear into the ether, 
Forgotten to time with the exception of the developers and the few fans they earned, and myself included. And I, I understand that. All I can do is hope that you give it a try, and with a little luck and a lot of optimism, you'll become a fan too. Arcane Studios was not a developer I'd really paid any attention to, let alone had been a fan of, leading up to the release of Dishonored in 2012. When that game came out, however, I was so captivated by its exceptional stealth gameplay, its visually intoxicating level design, and its universe building that I not only played it several times over to experience every last nook and cranny it had to offer, I also gave it my choice for the game of the year. Its sequel, which arrived in 2016, was very well done as well, and also earned its spot in the middle of my list that year, but many parts of it felt like a safe retreading of existing territory, despite its engaging storytelling, and thus wasn't able to climb any higher than the number 5 spot. At the same time, it became one of the gaming industry's worst kept secrets that the Prey franchise, having been on the receiving end of a tumultuous amount of disdain from gamers and the press after the E3 2011 reveal and subsequent cancellation thereof of the incredibly ambitious Prey 2 that it had been handed off to Arcane to work on. What we got wasn't the Prey sequel that Human Head Studios had first offered us, and to be fair, those demos were perhaps too ostentatious for the reality of the developers' capabilities and their scope of potential. No, instead what we received was perhaps the exact opposite of what could have been imagined. An open world techno horror exploration shooter, not like that of System Shock. To be compared to the likes of the System Shock franchise is already worthy of being considered a high quality experience, but this new Prey is an elaborate and, and psychologically challenging first person title that is very smart in its execution and engaging from start to finish. Okay, admittingly, that's probably a bit more hyperbole than Prey deserves, but it's still a damn fine game. As Morgan Yu, an amnesic child prodigy of science in an alternate timeline in which science, society, and political events never really quite left the 1960s, you find yourself on board Talos-1, a large space station in orbit around the moon in 2035, where, as things tend to occur in these science fiction games, something has gone terribly wrong. Alien life known as the Typhon which humanity has contained the study in secrecy for over a half century, has escaped containment and taken over the station, with its few human survivors scattered all over. As Morgan, it's your open-ended goal to survive and, eventually, escape back to Earth. The heart of the greatness that is this new prey is fundamentally split into two parts. The first of which is easily the survival horror this game puts you through. It's clear after the first 10 minutes of the experience that your amnesia is not by accident, and that your involvement with the Typhon and Transtar, the corporation leading the study of the aliens, is anything but minute. With, or at the behest of, your brother's cryptic aid over the radio, you as Morgan are increasingly challenged by the Typhon as you fight to survive in the environment where you never, ever feel totally safe. Between the lightning fast mimics which can transform into anything, and I do mean goddamn anything, in the environment, to the Nightmare, which actively hunts Morgan throughout the game, you'll never feel like you're in a secure environment. Heck, there are times in which your own tools and allies can be a threat, thanks to overusing your Typhon powers. Danger is everywhere. On the flip side though, Talos 1 may be the biggest star of the game. While you are on a space station which means a limited arrangement of environments and areas to explore, Talos 1 feels incredibly fleshed out and realized. Simply put, if you see a place, 95% of the time you can find a way to get there. Whether it's through climbing using your glue gun, some creative shots with your nerf bow and arrows to hit access buttons, or doing an EVA outside the station to access an exposed compartment, it's the first game in a long while that it not only feels logically and realistically put together, but also never says no, at most saying not yet. Despite its compacted nature, there's an incredible amount of stuff to explore and do in Prey. I simply adore Prey, and I find it incredible that Arcane has not only been able to split its focus between two remarkably different franchises and come away a winner in both directions, they've also put together a game that overcomes the chaotic background behind its origin and rebirth from a franchise about Native Americans fighting aliens, to survival titles set in orbit around the moon. With the foundation Arcane is laid, I expect that Prey 2 will be far better remembered than the cancelled title it shares its name with. Like many of us on the site, I too am a fan of Capcom's Resident Evil franchise. Or rather, I was then suddenly wasn't. 
At midnight on October 2nd, 2012, I had the distinct pleasure of representing 4Player as the first person to stream the game for us before our audience, and for the first 10 minutes, it really was a pleasure. The hours that followed, however, turned into a nightmare of confusion, bewilderment, and unadulterated disappointment. Capcom, it seemed, had lost their goddamn minds when it came to determining the vision of what this franchise was to be, and my taste for any entry made after 2003 was distinctly soured. And then, at E3 2016, in the middle of Sony's annual presentation, they dropped the bomb. Resident Evil 7 was bringing the series back to its horror roots, this time in first person, and that it would be dropping in just over seven months. At the very least, you could say we were cautiously optimistic here, at most, outright ecstatic about a much-needed change in pace. And you know what? It turned out pretty good. In fact, it was pretty great. Again, I'd rather not reiterate most of what my colleagues have said about the game. This suffice to say, it's damn good and you should play it, but I would like to mention a couple things. For me, the greatest aspect of this game was how Resident Evil 7 tried to tell a coherent, individual story without including the machinations of side characters and mysterious off-screen bosses that would sequel monger and demand a vast transmedia campaign. Instead, it's a classic B-horror movie experience with the Resident Evil signature biohazardous twist. Ethan enters dangerous territory in a backwater swamp in Louisiana, searching for his missing wife only to discover that not only is she being kept in captivity by super-powered, insane rejects from the Emil's eyes, she's on the cusp of becoming one herself. The entire experience of being hunted by Jack, Marguerite, and Lucas really reminds me of my favorite entry in the franchise, Resident Evil 3, in which you never really felt safe as the nemesis beast could appear out of nowhere and could absolutely wreck you. The same goes for the bakers of whom you can stab, shoot, burn, blow up, and even slice them through with a chainsaw, only to have them come back meaner and tougher than before. On the flip side though, I became really disappointed with the enemy variety beyond what the bakers had to offer. The molded were, honestly, pretty boring to deal with after the first hour, with only a handful of variants to be found therein. They were just big, ugly Capcom takes on Venom from the Spider-Man franchise. They could have definitely done better here with them. And I also don't think that the VR aspect of the game is as much as it's hyped up to be by Nick and some of the others. The technology simply isn't where I think it needs to be just yet, and the visual fidelity sacrifices you have to tolerate in order to experience the game on PSVR kind of eats at me. It, it, I, I, know, I know, it's a dumb, minor thing, but that's just me. I wish that I could say I liked Resident Evil 7 more than I did, and perhaps I will once I play through the DLC for Zoe and Chris Redfield. Until then, however, this isn't going any higher than my number 5 spot. Three years ago, we got a game that enthralled many of us here at 4Player, The Evil Within. At the time, while I could appreciate that Shinji Mikami was at the helm of the project, and that it was intended to be his big comeback after Capcom finally gave him and his compatriots the boot, I was interested, but not quite sold on it. What I ended up playing was, I, I feel, a reinterpretation of what made Resident Evil 4 good 10 years later, but without a real grasp of any of the innovations that had been made since its release. I was also heavily put off by the story. I mean, sure, I know the narrative reason for which it was so disjointed, but the pacing and lack of definitive player-informing storytelling that slowly peeled back the mystery of just what the hell was happening in Crimson City felt half-baked. It was clear, however, that if they were given more time to learn from their mistakes with the sequel, then it would be a far better product than the first. I don't think I was quite prepared, however, just for how much better it would turn out to be. I was genuinely surprised by The Evil Within 2. Not only for the scaling up of the scope of the game, from a linear fever dream of disjointed levels glued together by transitions of things that go above the night, to a large, open world and ultimately very well-polished experience. Despite the explanation for the events at the end of the first game, and the questionable motivations for the Not Umbrella Corporation, that is Mobius, Tango Gameworks strangely found a way to tell an intimate story about protagonist Sebastian Castellanos. Within the first 20 minutes of the sequel, as you enter Union for the first time and begin to discover the game's mechanics, it becomes clear that this game will steer you in the right direction, but never drags you by the wrist towards it. Though I wish there were more fragments of Union to explore, and that your NPC companions did a bit more to aid you beyond hiding in a safe room and guarding the wonderful coffee pot, 
I found exploring the streets and homes of the town to be a rather exciting yet nerve-wracking affair. It honestly felt like what Mikami and his team would have done if they had been in charge of making Resident Evil 5. Building off the predecessor's strengths and expanding the scope of what the franchise can be. What surprised me the most, though, was how much I enjoyed the game's story. Though the game's marketing did a lackluster job of making the inclusion of Lily, Sebastian's supposedly dead daughter, only briefly mentioned in the first game, I feel like anything more than a hackneyed attempt to make the game appear as if it were to be an emotional experience, I came to really enjoy and cheer on Sebastian as he searched Union for his kidnapped daughter. In fact, I came to enjoy it so much that I consider the final two hours of The Evil Within 2 to be some of the best I've played all year long. It's that fucking good. The Evil Within 2 is very much the Assassin's Creed 2 to Assassin's Creed. A realization of the potential of the first experience with refined gameplay, a great story, and a charm that the first game never really quite captured. I loved it, and the public deserves to give this game a second shot at greatness. So go out and buy it, will you? If there was one thing that could be said about 2017, it's that it marks the return of the 3D mascot platformer. Between a proper 3D Mario game, a remastered Crash Bandicoot trilogy, and a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie, not to mention so many others that were attempting to grab the limelight, the genre has been lacking in quantity. However, for me, no other 3D platformer could bring the charm fun and wonder quite like a hat in time. The game had been a Kickstarter project which launched way back in 2013, but ending up raising nearly 10 times its initial goal of a mere 30,000. Unlike some more prominent crowdfunding horror stories we've slowly grown accustomed to over the past several years, A Hat in Time does not stand within this crowd. In fact, I consider it one of the best damn games of 2017. A Hat in Time oozes charm from every pore, every pixel of every level you play, and the variety of gameplay on tap is far more varied than you would have ever thought it could be. Last year I made a similar analogy about Titanfall 2, in which I stated that the designers seemed to have come up with tons of interesting mechanics that were cool and fun to play with, but couldn't be made into something that would be worth basing the entire game around. The same is true here, as the world variety, bosses, and the level design makes it so the few levels ever feel samey. One minute you're taking on a mafia boss on stage, rolling around on top of a ball made entirely of his minions, the next you're scrounging for clues as to the identity of a murderer on board the Owl Express. Just a few levels later you find yourself as the leader in a parade in your honor on the rooftops of a town run by fanboy penguins. Then you eventually find yourself fighting a giant demonic toilet in an effort to earn back your soul. Hell, there's even a stage that's a straight-up horror experience that, despite this being a 3D collectathon platformer, had me a little scared for my character. There's so much to experience here that you will never get bored. It's a bit tough to concisely describe all the aspects that make a hat in time one of my favorite games of 2017. Hell, I kind of wish that I'd reviewed it so that I could relate just all the components that bring it together. A great soundtrack, rather solid platforming, well done writing, even better done voice acting, tons to do and see, lots of hidden and lockable content, the works. Heck, there's still much to look forward to, as Gears for Breakfast, the developer, is looking to release two additional worlds as free DLC later on down the line. So for 30 bucks, there's a whole lot to love here. Give it a shot, or if you happen to have a certain streamer that you really enjoy watching that played the game once and stopped to play, of all things, Mass Effect Andromeda, maybe convince them to give it more than just an hour of the time. It's really good. My god, Nintendo certainly took their sweet time in putting this one out. Over five and a half years and nearly an entire console generation on from the motion-focused monster that was Skyward Sword, Eiji Anuma and crew were tasked with repeating history, to go back to the drawing board and reinvent the Legend of Zelda franchise. Two years on past its initially announced release window, it finally arrived to mark not only the final title to arrive on the Wii U, but also THE launch title for the Switch. And god damn, they couldn't have chosen a finer title to launch their newest console with, as it's one of the best games of the year. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is, simply put, a remarkable game. 
I found myself finally getting a Switch in April, and Zelda became almost my entire focus for that month, as I spent nearly 100 hours exploring almost every nook and cranny, completing every shrine, and doing almost every side quest the game had to offer. As pretty much everyone on the podcast has described over the year, Breath of the Wild is a refreshing take on the traditional Zelda formula as it ditches the classic gimmick focus an entire Zelda game is built off of. No motion controlled BS, no lycanthropy, sailing, masks, or time manipulation. It's just you, the world, and physics to manipulate as you go along your way. It feels like a special moment when Link rises out of the Shrine of Resurrection, walks out towards the cliff's edge, and sees Hyrule Castle in the distance as the camera pans across the landscape. In that moment, you know you're not about to play a traditional Zelda experience, and other than a general broad outline of the structure of the game, very few elements remain in common. Much of the game's betterment, but also in some minor ways to its detriment. Like the others have preached, Breath of the Wild feels like an unshackling of the player, allowing you to go wherever, do whatever, and almost however you want. With that freedom, however, comes a significant burden to bear. The game is remarkably punishing early on when you're still adjusting to the combat system, for example. The enemies that occupy the forests, deserts, mountains, and plains are not scaled equally, and going off in the wrong direction without following the suggested path within your first 10 hours or so can result in a very grueling time. That's not to say that it's not an exciting time, though. Thanks to the incredible size of the world and the mind-boggling assortment of places to visit and things to discover, the hard journey is worth experiencing. That being said, I do take some issue with how much freedom the game thrusts upon the player. There's a significant old school charm that's now gone with this new design direction. Gone are the interesting dungeons, the Metroidvania exploration focus, and most importantly, the unique and exciting tools that gated both of these gameplay aspects that were core to the franchise's formula up until this title. It's now just down to you, your stamina, physics, and the manipulation of the tools your Shiga Slate offers. The game's four primary dungeons, while interesting in theory, become rotation puzzles without really any character or charm other than the position they are in the world. Previously, we celebrated the dungeon design of a Zelda game. Now, the most we can celebrate about them is either your approach to boarding the Divine Beasts, or the fact that you're done with them and can return to exploring Hyrule. I also truly miss the assortment of tools and weapons we had previously. Though many were designed to solve puzzles within the dungeon you found it in, or perhaps a few things that appear as side quests, there's not much of that to be found in the Breath of the Wild. Seriously, if you don't think that this new game could benefit from something like an ocarina, a hookshot, or a mystical magnifying glass, I feel you're missing out on some of the gameplay possibilities that could only complement Breath of the Wild. Though it does sound like I'm making dumb, archaic arguments about the game, I really, really do love Breath of the Wild. Perhaps the most remarkable thing in Breath of the Wild was something that probably should have been addressed long, long ago. Character development. Yes, Link has always been, and probably will remain, a blank slate for the player, but it's his titular counterpart that really struck me as, for the first time in nearly 15 years, developed. While you only really encounter Zelda at the very end of the game, the flashback memories you collect spend a tale of a princess that's haunted by her impending destiny and fearful of the fact that she doesn't know how to embrace the power that she's prophesied to wield. As you encounter each new memory, you watch her debate her role in this endless cycle as she travels Hyrule, hoping to unlock her potential, only to be blocked or defeated at almost every turn. It's something the franchise has never really addressed, nor has it really given any screen time to before, and something that gives some substantial basis for the series being called The Legend of Zelda, not The Legend of Link. I could probably talk on and goddamn on about Breath of the Wild, but I simply don't have time for that. The latest entry in the Zelda franchise is one to be celebrated, and I won't stand in the way of that. Hell, I'll line up and march with everybody else. You love it, I love it, it deserves all the praise it can get. Nintendo, for the first time in a decade, I finally feel you've put out a really fucking good game. Over the past year, I've played shooters, adventure titles, survival horror, platformers, strategy, RPGs, tower defense, stealth, collectathon, and hell, even a golf game. The variety on hand this year was phenomenal, and 2017 will be remembered as one of the most diverse in modern times for this industry. 
However, there was no other title that was as successful, as addictive, as punishing, and as talked about this year as my number one. I had never played a game quite like it, and the industry is surely in a flurry at the moment to design derivative titles with their own takes on the formula, while others are trying to whip up their own mode for their existing games as soon as possible. There are still some who argue it will be remembered as lightning in a bottle, due to be lost to time after the next big thing takes the formula, and runs with it, and makes it even more fun and accessible than this game ever could. I see to those that argue this that no, player unknowns Battlegrounds, the PC darling that took the gaming world by storm is not a fluke or accident. Rather, it's a combination of the right gameplay mechanics and ideas before the right audience at the exact right time. Last year, I made the argument that just because I had played a game exponentially more than any other that year did not mean that it was my favorite, and I still stand by that statement. However, I feel that one also coming back to haunt me as I put in over 400 hours into Battlegrounds over the course of a 7 month period. Instead of giving so many other games the time of day like Nier Automata or Neo or Hellblade, I chose instead almost every night to get on my computer, load up PUBG, and cast myself out onto a map with 100 other players in a punishing battle royale. If there was ever a game to properly bear the term frustrating, then PUBG is certainly it. You know, it's really hard to come up with a compelling and reasonable argument for playing a game that much, despite most of the action occurring on a single map and a single mode of play. With that being said, I think I would choose to describe the base motion I feel in most matches that I play in to be exhilaration. In a game about one life to live in a match, the thrill of the hunt for other players, and knowing that they are absolutely as vulnerable as you are, makes me feel as if I'm on a level of equal footing that I rarely ever feel in a multiplayer game. The act of survival until the final moments of a match, as the count of how many other players are alive and the active zone in which they are in steadily shrinks away, gets my blood pumping like few other games I've ever played. The act of survival, for a large part, is down to risk, reward, and a hell of a lot of luck. The adrenaline that surges in me getting my heart pumping, and has me silently listening for footsteps and watching for the tiniest pixel on my monitor to move, is exceptionally exciting. All of that a half hour match spent looting, traveling, and occasionally getting shot at just for the reward of a status screen proclaiming my victory and not much else sounds like a tremendous letdown on paper. And in truth, I can understand that argument. All that work for little reward would normally make me feel like you've wasted your time. But there's one other factor at play in here, the player count. When you fire your last bullet, killing your final opponent and the words winner winner chicken dinner appear on screen, you realize that you've come out on top of not one, not two, or four, but 99 other players who started the match just as you did, naked and helpless, and you feel remarkably good. Apart from being alone, PUBG has also sourced some of the most fun I've had with the community since I came to 4-player. Between our regular squad of duders and newcomers that arrive every now and then, the teamwork, camaraderie, and shenanigans that we've engaged in as a group has been the most amusing I've had outside of my normal circle of friends. Despite nearly a year's worth of physics glitches, cheaters, server disconnects, and just all-around jank, we stuck together as a group in pursuit of the least rewarding poultry victory one could fairly design. I love Player Unknown's Battle Rounds. With over 400 hours in the bank, and I'm sure many, many more to come, I feel I've come to play a game that, though of fairly humble beginnings, will continue to grow into something that will not only positively influence the gaming industry for years to come, but will eventually earn its place as one of the best games of the decade. Alright guys, that's it. That's my list of my favorite games for 2017. As usual, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you take the time to check out some of the games I mentioned. Also, this isn't the end of our Game of the Year coverage either. We still have your two videos coming, and we should be putting them up relatively soon. But thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great 2018.